Good morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I didn't want to quit worshiping, uh, did you? I just wanted to keep going, keep going, you know. Come on. We, we don't get enough of that, do we? We don't get enough of that. That's, he is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy. He is so worthy. Friday night when you were having harp and bowl, I was I've been having my own harp and bowl in in Salem, and uh, at the house of prayer, and uh, the the singers, the praisers did kind of like what you just did, and uh, it just it just I had a meltdown. You know what a meltdown is? We all need a meltdown once in a while, don't we? Where we just we just get a gully washer, just boom, you know, and you can't control it. Well, you could. You could shut it off, but who wants to? You know what I mean? Who wants to shut it off when his presence is so precious and so dear? You just, you just grab him around the ankles and you just say, never let, I'm never going to let go of you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I, I love you, Jesus. I just love you. I, I don't know what to say, but I love you. I love you. I love you. And you just don't want to quit. You just don't want to quit. Amen? (laughs) And that's real love. Hallelujah. That's genuine love. That's not, I love you, Lord. You're great. I think you're awesome. I think you're wonderful. I might bow down someday. (laughs) I got on the train in Tokyo. My son was with me, the one that does a lot of work with Heidi Baker in Mozambique now. And, and uh, oh, he has fallen head over heels in love with Jesus. I mean, I hate to say he almost shames me. You know what I mean? When we get in a meeting, he just, ah, oh, he, he gets to spend a lot of soaking time. You know what I mean? I don't get to spend a lot of soaking time. I'm too on the go, on the go, on the go, on the go. <laughs> it takes time to have soaking time. Do you know that? If you have the time, don't don't delay. I mean, you know, get involved in it. Don't don't stay back. Get in there. Dive in and get under the waters. Hallelujah. And stay under. <laughs> I was <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't stand still. <laughs> I'm not a nervous person. I'm a prayer walker. <laughs> if, you, if you stick me behind the podium and make me fold my hands. What are you laughing at? You know? <laughs> my best communion is with the Lord when I'm walking. I love that song. I cut my teeth on it. You know what it means to cut your teeth? I was a kid when they sang it. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Oh, my word. Have you ever had Jesus tell you that you are his very own, that he loves you? Have you ever had him say to you, I love you, I love you, I love you? That's why you say it back to him, because he says it to you. Oh, well, I was on this train, and, and my son Peter had gone with me to Japan that trip, and my interpreter and his wife was on the other side of the, the car of the train facing me, and they grabbed those three f- seats, and I grabbed this. And if you're ever in Tokyo, you grab the seats while you can. You know what I mean? And <laughs> before you realize it, it's wall-to-wall people. It depends on what stop they stop at. And they're standing there packed in like sardines. So I'm always hanging on up here with both hands. I don't keep my hands down on my side. If you ever on a train in Tokyo, you'll know why. It can be indecent. You know what I mean? I've seen people snoring on the trains in Tokyo. They're sleeping so hard, but they can't fall over because they're so stuffed in like sardines. <laughs> All of a sudden, they wake up when people are moving out and realize, whoops, the train stopped. It's unloading. I got, let's see, two more stops. Well, <laughs> You inhale, you exhale on those trains. Well, it wasn't one of those moments. <laughs> Thank God. You did get a, a little reprieve once in a while. But anyhow, this big heavy set gentleman come and sit down beside me, and I thought it's time to go to work. It's called Marketplace Ministry, right? And, and I pull out my little red 
covered personal Bible for comfort, assurance, and salvation. And I said, sir, would you like one of these? And uh, he pushed it away, and he said, I would use that for toilet paper. Uh, Oops. I guess I didn't discern that one properly, Lord. (laughs) No hunger there. (laughs) Ah, Lord, what do I do? Just love on him. Now, that's not easy ones to love on, especially when you get an introduction like that. How much love do you have? What does it take to drain your love? Huh? What does it take for you to go empty? How many of you like to go empty? How many of you like that little thing on your car that goes empty, and all of a sudden the car is choking, and you're like, oh, no, I didn't get gas. It's a miserable experience, isn't it? Especially if you have a diesel-powered motor. Don't ever run out of gas with a diesel-powered motor. Oh, man, that's expensive. You've got to bleed each of those injectors because there's air in there, and it will never run right till you do. If you have one, ladies, take that as a little little bit extra right there, okay? Never run out of petrol or fuel or diesel if you have a diesel-powered one, okay? I don't care if it's a Mercedes. I don't care, Lexus or whatever. Don't run out of petrol, all right? Thank you. It takes a lot of bleeding to get you on the road again. (laughs) In the walk of the Spirit, it can be the same thing. Don't let your batteries go dead. It's called standing still. It's standing, nothing happening. Oh, isn't that miserable? Turn the key and nothing happens. Oh, no, I left the dome light on all night. Ah. Well, see, that's, that's the natural. And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46, talks about that, doesn't it? And it says, that which was first is not spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. So I'm just starting out with the natural, because we're going to get in the spiritual in a minute. Hallelujah. I love to get in the spirit. That's where I'm alive. Oh, hallelujah. That's where I come alive. <laughs> That's where I dance with my I dance with my Lord more alone than I do in front of people. I'm a very private worshiper that way, but I get up in the middle of a night when nobody's awake and I have my time with my Lord. Oh, we have romance. You say, "What?" What are you talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> I'm going to get married. <laughs> I'm engaged. Are you? Yeah, I've been married almost 50 years to my wife, but I want to tell you something. I'm engaged to somebody else, (laughs) and I'm going to get married, and there's going to be a wedding, a wedding of the ages, and it's getting close and closer and closer. I thought it was going to happen when I was 17 years old when I got filled with the Spirit. I wanted everybody to get ready to this wedding. That's been, dear Lord, I can't even calculate how many years ago. I don't even want to think back there. I stopped at 39. I'm holding. (laughs) I've got too many countries to go to. Yeah, this year I get my 50th country. This year is my jubilee. Hallelujah. The 1st of September, I have my jubilee. Glory to God my 50th country, and then I'm going to go to my 51st, and then my 52nd, but I get my 50th this year. This is an awesome year to have a jubilee. Do you know that? It'll be my 50th island of Japan, so it's a double jubilee. I'm praying which island is going to be my jubilee island of Japan. Hallelujah. I've walked, I don't count them just because I hop off of a plane and hop on another one. Come on now, be honest. I only count islands and nations if I have walked them and prayed them, been with teams on them. That's when it's real. That's when the memories of that geographical area are indelibly imprinted in your memory, and you'll never forget it. When I walk and pray an area, I get into that area. I know right where I am. I know right what I prayed. My memory comes back. Then it's photographic memory. 
I don't have it otherwise, believe me. I studied advanced calculus, advanced physics, and chemistry, you know, for engineering. But I want to tell you something. I worked. Oh, boy, I worked. I hated it when that professor assigned me seven problems that had to be in by Monday. <laughs> in calculus. Hey, young people, we didn't have any. Our fingers, our fingers were not doing that. Our fingers were doing this nervously. How am I going to cover seven pages of math by Monday and get everything done Monday? Dear Lord, help me. It was called longhand. You know what I mean? I was so tickled pink when the slide rule came out. Slide rule. Would you believe that, Joel? Just a little piece of wood that you could slide a little stick in the middle? Oh, that saved me a half a page of math. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I guess you know by now. I'm excited about Jesus. I tell you, it won't be long. It's not going to be long and we're going to be with him. The doors of eternity are going to slam shut behind us. And we are going to be with our Lord forever. There'll be no watches, no time to watch. I just had to look. <laughs> time gets away from me. I, 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 Dr. Romanowski, the number one astrophysicist for NASA, heard me in Boston, Massachusetts, talk about my six hours in heaven and uh, how I got all the way to the Milky Way and back in less than 30 minutes. And he said, do you know how fast you had to be traveling? I says, no. He says, I don't either. It's incalculable. He says, at the speed of light, you'd have only got to Saturn. <laughs> you wouldn't have got back in 27, 30 minutes. I said, whew. Then that must explain something. A big hand clock like that one up there. For about six weeks after that death experience, I had to die to get to the, <laughs> to the Milky Way. <laughs> yeah. I had to die to this world. You don't travel that fast and be alive. You become a smear. <laughs> but for about six weeks, I would glance up at a clock like that, and the second hand was going backwards about this fast. And I'd say to my family, look at that. The second hand is going backwards. They'd say, it is not, Dad. It's going forward. And that deeply troubled me. I thought, am I losing my mind? It's going backwards, I'm telling you. Time is going backwards. Dad, it is not. My wife would say, honey, are you all right? I'd say, yeah, but it's going backwards, I'm telling you. And for three or four minutes, it'd go backwards. I was losing time. <laughs> I thought only Superman could do that, you know what I mean? <laughs> turn the world backwards. <laughs> Make that earthquake turn back, you know, and Boulder Dam go back together and all that water back behind the dam. <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I like that kind of thinking, you know. What's wrong with that, you know? There's a lot of things in this world I'd love to reverse, amen? Yeah. Say it never happened. Blink, and it'll all be over. It never happened. Oh. Wow, you're super. <laughs> well, so, so he said to me, he says, Henry, I, I asked him then, I said, then, then could I tell you something, doctor, and, and you won't think I'm crazy. And I told him about the second hand going backwards, and he says, I have no problem believing that. <laughs> I wanted to hug him. I said, Come on now. Are you serious? You have no problem with that? He says, absolutely not. He says, you see, when the astronauts are up there in the space station and they've been going around the earth and just flying around like they are, time is totally different to them. All you hear is they need debriefing when they get back. Time is never the same to them. They live in a totally different dimension with time after that, the rest of their life. And if you don't think I do, ask my wife. Now, guys, hang on. I'm not picking on you. Ladies, I'm not picking on you. But when I get home, I'm gone. Some, I was gone 11 months last year from home. My wife on the 27th of December said, Honey, don't do that to us next year, please. I said, Oh, okay, I'll try not to. But 
I'm already committed for Asia, January, February, and March, and the first week of April. <laughs> Go with me. You know I can't. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. I get back. You can have the rest of April and the first week of May, and we'll go anywhere you can go that you can travel, and we'll do anything you want to do. It's yours, honey. And she said, I'll take it. (laughs) She knows a good deal. Do you know the last time her and I had a month together without any children? Now it would be without grandchildren, (laughs) great-grandchildren. That's how long it's been. Do you realize what I said? It was the year that I died in that automobile accident. We panned out the children from Arizona to California to Oregon, all 13 of them, and the wife and I headed out in that van that was so crinkled and so rust buckety that had been everywhere but right side up with its windshield all glued in, horrible looking thing, but the best best witnessing tool I ever found in my life. Pull up to a light. <laughs> hey, anybody hurt in that wreck? Yeah, yeah, there was. One person died. If you'd like to pull over, I'll tell you about it. Oh, okay. Man, that thing is really crunched up. That's horrible. Who died? <laughs> Me. Let me tell you about it. (laughs) I went all the way to the Milky Way and back. Huh? Yeah, if you don't believe me, ask the astronomer, the head astronomer of the observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, the world's leading specialist on the Milky Way. I taught him for two hours about the Milky Way, things he never knew. (laughs) Oh, you don't believe me? Go talk to him. Talk to Dr. Romanowski, the head astrophysicist for NASA. Talk to him. He fully understands everything I experience. He believes it. If you don't, you got a problem. (laughs) We have an awesome universe out there. An awesome universe. I was standing in front of 250 non-spirit-filled traditional church people. I ministered all kinds. You saw in the little blurb in the bulletin, you never know where you're going to find Henry. I, we're working on a new website this week. My son Peter's home, and he's going to help, and he's, he's got his degree in graphics and all that. And so he's going to finally apply it instead of missionary work. You know what I mean? <laughs> help me with doing, redoing my website. But I said, look, there's only one change that I'm interested in on that thing. When you go to give my itinerary, I just want you to title it, Where in the World is Henry Groover? That's all. Would you do that for me? Just title it, Where in the World is Henry Groover? Because I never know where I'm going to be. Now, I'm believing with all my heart the time is coming real soon, because I've really been crying out about this, that he's going to start translating me more. I'm tired of jumbo jets, are you? I'm tired of having to do all this, you know, in the back room in the larder. You know what I'm doing? That's not because I'm full of the Holy Ghost. It's because my legs are cramping on me sitting all that time. Ah, I haven't yet got the nerve to to get down in the larder and do push-ups. But believe me, there's times I'd like to because I get so bored sitting for 15, 20 hours, 46 hours flying, and you finally get home. You know, that's two days almost. Like I told you, I'm not a sitter. I'm a walker. It's hard for me to sit, and especially if they put me in the middle with two people on each side. I'm in the middle. I'm in trouble. Oh, I'm in agony. Lord, why would you do this to me? He did it to me flying from Istanbul to New York. That's a 21-hour flight. (laughs) Oh, Lord, why did you do this? The Lord said, just look around you, and and then you'll know why. I look all around, I got Muslims all around me. I'm in the middle of nothing but Muslim university students. And the Lord says, I put you in the middle of a harvest. It's time to do some harvesting, son. I said, where do I begin? 
He says, just introduce yourself to the person the right and the left. I thought, okay, here it goes. I got I to gotta really have wisdom, Lord, in what I say. I mean, I'm in the middle. I might get a knife between the fourth and fifth rib, and when the plane unloads, I'll still be sitting there. Chunk of my body full of blood, but there's no exterior bleeding, you know. They'll say, well, he died of a heart attack. Well, of course. <laughs> hey, I've dealt with all kinds of people. I dealt with a guy that could stab the apple that I was eating, said, put it on the fence post. You don't think that I can hit a person between the fourth and fifth rib standing at an intersection waiting for the walk light, and they drop dead right there, and I say, hey, this person just had a heart attack. Call for an ambulance. And everybody comes running, then I get up and walk away. I'm the one that did it. And I said, oh, come on. Put your apple on the fence post. I didn't even see his hand move. And I said, well, when are you going to hit it? He said, I already did. What do you mean? He says, look at your apple. That switchblade went clear through that apple and back, and it didn't even come off of that fence post. I believed him. I don't ever want to get you mad at me. (laughs) But that man fell so in love with Jesus. He finally put his blade away. First, he had to put his sidearm away. You know that iron? (laughs) We're sitting in a restaurant. My back is to the restaurant. He would never sit with his back to anybody in a restaurant. He had to be at the corner booth. Oh, we waited so many times for that corner booth. You know what I mean? No windows behind his back. Why? He had been a hitman for the mafia. He was the right-hand bodyguard for the head father of the whole southwestern United States. Didn't remember how many people he had killed. When I first met him, he told me that, and he says, and I wouldn't hesitate to kill you if I didn't like you. I thought, this guy's unreal. (laughs) He had my attention, though. (laughs) And we're sitting there. This is after months after he'd come to the Lord. And all of a sudden, he goes like this, and he's got a hold of his, his pistol. And I'm sitting with my back to the restaurant, and I says, Bulldog. That was his underworld name. I only addressed him Bulldog when I felt he was reverting back to the mafia. Otherwise, it was Larry <laughs> or Smith. You know, there's a lot of Smiths in the world. They can hide in the world. If you're a Smith, you, you, look at, you looked at the phone book lately? How many pages of Smiths are in there? <laughs> Well, anyhow, I said, Bulldog, when are you going to get rid of that sidearm? He says, hey, man, it's not your life, it's mine. I said, Bulldog, if they go to shoot you, they're going to hit me first because my back is to the restaurant. He kind of looks at me and grins with that strange Popeye Bluto look. You know what I mean, the big old guy? He looked kind of like him, only he wasn't as tall, but he was this kind of body. Spent 40 years building a body, and he laughs in his old laugh, deep laugh, and he says, I never thought about that. I said, well, it's time to think about it. I'm tired of sitting in the corner of a restaurant. I'm tired of when we want to talk after a meeting. You've got to go out in the middle of the big mall parking lot where it's totally empty, and we park one this way and one this way, and we stand in the middle to talk. It's time to get over that fear, bulldog. It's time to start living, brother. You have a host of angels around you, and they're far more powerful than your little piece of metal or your blade. It's time to let go of what you have as a security blanket. Oh, now, don't go too far on that, Henry. You're going to hurt me. (laughs) What is your security blanket? I'm not your judge. You answer these questions for yourself. All right, this is not a pop quiz of we're not going to pass the paper around and see how well you did. (laughs) But what is your security blanket? 911? Oh, I think I'm having a heart attack. 911. I think I'm having a heart attack. Get an ambulance here quick. Or are you going to call on heaven? Where's your security blanket? What if we lose our medical profession? It's looking kind of shaky right now. I won't go any farther on that. (laughs) 
A lot of doctors are literally getting out of the medical field right now. I'm meeting them all across America. So I'm, they're telling me I'm not asking them. They're going to another profession because they say, we won't be able to make a living anymore. It won't be long. We won't be able to make a living. Something's going on in our country. But you know, a good thing happened a few days ago. If you've been praying for our leadership of our nation, keep it up. An awesome thing happened. Our president sent our ambassador to the UN in Geneva, Switzerland. Did you see it? To be a part who was a part of the United Nations Security Council on Human Rights. We, we have a representation in that council. And they gathered together condemning Israel for human rights violations. And in their council, they want to bring lawsuits against Israel for what they're doing to the Palestinians. Guess what our ambassador was told to do by our president? If, you don't, if you're not happy about him right now, you're going to be happy when I tell you. He told our ambassador, vote against it. Tell that council Israel has every right to defend themselves. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been praying for that man that his heart will change because I watched him talking to Netanyahu right in the White House and just less than 48 hours later, the earthquake hit the White House, the Capitol, the National Cathedral, all the way to Maine. And the Native Americans up there said there's never been an earthquake in the history of mankind handed down through their nations and their, their generations of an earthquake there. He told Netanyahu, I'm going over here with the leaders of Russia, China, and Germany, and other nations, and have lunch with them after this meeting. And we are going to then go to the UN in New York City, and we are going to introduce a bill. This was after Japan already voiced their bill in Geneva. And 48 hours to the minute later was the Sendai earthquake and the tsunami. And it got me into the leadership of Japan, and I stood before the, the Senate of Japan. I went from office to office of the senators of Japan, laying hands on each of their heads, praying for them. Why? It shook them because I gave in the big theological seminary. Why the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan? And for two hours and 48 minutes it took to deliver. That was with an interpreter, so that would be an hour and 24 minutes. <laughs> I'm watching the clock. Honestly, I am. <laughs> I didn't know the mother of one of the top people that was up for, real, up for election to be the prime minister of Japan. I didn't know she was a godly woman, and she was in that meeting at that theological seminary among hundreds of people. She wouldn't leave till she got a copy of the DVD of my presentation. She flew to Tokyo, put it in the hands of her son and said, Promise me, son, you will not go to bed tonight until you have watched this. You will understand why the Sendai earthquake, the Daiichi power plant failure, why the tsunami that wiped out 250 miles of coastland with a 100-foot wave traveling 500 miles an hour. Did you know? That's, that's what it did. I've been there. I've walked that land. You say, oh, come on, it didn't go that fast. Then why did it take, why did that tsunami hit the Oregon, the California coast before a jumbo jet could get here? Hmm? Think about it. It's a simple calculation. It takes some time to take off and land, doesn't it? And that wave's going. It's way ahead of you before you ever get up to speed in the air. And it hits before you get there. Well, see, this book, this book is ready to be highly esteemed once again on the face of the earth. It's got to be brought back to our schools. It's got to be brought back to our Senate. It's got to be brought back to our nation. I have spent 10, 12 hours in schools in Russia, grade school, through high school, they didn't even stop for breaks or lunch sharing out of this book 
are they going to become more righteous than the United States of America? Does that make you tremble? You see what I'm saying? Keep praying. Keep praying for our president to change his mind and to back Israel in this. That is a miracle. That is a complete flip-flop of what he told Netanyahu. And when Netanyahu pointed at him there in the White House and said, Mr. President, that will never happen. Number one, we will never give back Jerusalem. We will not give back the land since 1967. To do that, that leaves our border less than eight miles wide. We have no defense. To do that, we have literally agreed to the demise of Israel as a nation. No, Mr. President, we will never agree to that. And he stood up. And he said, well, I'm going to lunch, and turned his back on him. And they ushered Netanyahu out the servant's door of the White House. Even CNN said, and even SMB, MSNBC, if you happen to listen to them, please don't. I do just as, I want the whole story, you know what I mean? I rarely get it. At home we got it, so I want to see all three, MSNBC, CNN, and Fox. I want to see all three of them. It's amazing how they read the news. How do they get some of those things out of that? How does that short, brown-haired lady, what's her name? How does she get those things out of I don't know where she gets that from. I can't pick that out of the air anywhere. I think it comes from way down there. I pray for her, too. I'd love to see that kind of person. Do you know who I'm talking about? That kind of person, when I meet them in a bar, what, a nightclub, a dance hall, hey, I was raised Pentecostal, I was told you go to those places, if the rapture takes place, you get left behind. (laughs) I was scared to death at 18 years old, walking the streets of Phoenix, Arizona, when I saw these people walking with these little brown bags, bottle in there, if you don't know. The other arm on a prostitute. And I stood looking down that street and I said, Dear Lord, this is Saturday night. Everything else is closed. The town is empty except this place. If I go in there and you come back, I'll be left behind. Help, Lord. I had just graduated not long before from high school. I ran in high school. I played basketball. I played football. Ran in track and I jumped. So I was in good shape. You know what I did? I took off running as fast as I could go. Hey, hey, take, 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 take one of these. And I ran back out. <laughs> Whew. Thank you, Jesus, you didn't come. Oh, Lord. That first Saturday night, I got rid of three tracks. I made a vow I would go on the street and not leave until I got rid of 100 tracks. Now I got 97, and next Saturday I got 197. Oh, Lord, I'm going to be out of breath. How am I ever going to do this? Mathematically, this is impossible. Help, Lord. (laughs) And the Lord dealt with me that Sunday morning. He said to me, look at my word. You see, the answer is always in the word. You can be taught particular truths in the Bible, and they can bind you the way they're taught. It didn't help on the church wall. We had a a painting about this wide and this high of the rapture. Nobody went out of a bar. Nobody went up white out of a nightclub. Nobody went out white out of a movie show or a dance. And I'm walking in the middle of this. Surely I'll be left behind. But the Lord began to deal with me and said, look in my word. Why did they call me a friend of publicans and sinners? Why does the word publican look? I looked it up. Uh, nightclub bar people. How do you become a friend of them if you're not out there? <laughs> now, I, I was in Dallas, Texas a year later after that. Went over there to go to university because I wanted to, well, Dallas was a big electronics area that time, and so I I wanted to do, get 
familiar with those electronic companies. And uh, so I went there to get my degree. And, and uh, that was the days of segregation. If you had the color of skin I do, you never walk across that line into the black part of town, right? My daddy made every one of us children colorblind. One Sunday a month when I was little, he took us to the black church. We were the only white people on the south side of town in that church. And I'll tell you, I have some of the most precious memories among those black people. I remember this tall, lanky brother, about six inches taller than me. He'd stand up there on that stage playing that violin. And my brothers or one of us would elbow, hey, it's time to watch up front. And when he'd start playing like this, that violin, we knew at any instant he's just going to, all in one motion, just set that bow against the wall, lean that violin against the wall, and we would say, here he comes. And these were those old wooden chairs, you know what I mean, folding chairs. He would take off on a dead run, and he would jump on the backs of those folding chairs all the way to the back of the church, run across the back of the church, turn and come and never kick one person in the head or step on their shoulder or anything, run all the way, his eyes tightly closed, glorifying God, and he'd go right back to the same place, grab that bow and that violin and not miss a lick. And Daddy would say, now that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> You see, we sing it. It is no secret what God can do. Do you want to be able to do that? I'd like to play the violin, let alone dance like that. <laughs> what he's done for others, he will do for you. How? With arms wide open. I can't sing like you can, brother. I'd love to, but he'll pardon you. It is no secret. What God can do. You know, Deuteronomy 29, I know it's Old Testament, 29, 29. But that Old Testament is clearly defined that it was written that we might not err as they erred. And that means make the same mistakes. That's a King James translation word, err. But it means make the same mistakes they made and fell in the wilderness. Well, are we still having wilderness experiences? Hmm. You mean the birth of Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church, didn't obliterate wilderness experiences? Is there anybody here that's never had a wilderness experience? Come on. Where are you? Oh, there are no liars here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not one. No, not one. <laughs> I'm jumping all over, but you know what? This is a smorgasbord morning. How many like to go to a smorgasbord? You can get what you want on your plate as much as you want, as many times back as you want. <laughs> Since I've been with you last year, was it? Uh, I was up in Vancouver, British Columbia after I was here and uh, then went to Vancouver Island, went back to Richmond, Vancouver for a meeting. And the pastor, as I left, I was uh, scheduled the next morning to head back across the Peace Arch there, the, the border. And he says, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be heavy duty because this is, this is just a lot of people are coming over to America for the 4th of July. So... You're going to have a, quite a weight at the border. So he says, look, uh, here's a CD. Now he says, I want you to listen to it. And this man is a 97-year-old preacher. He's been preaching for many years. So I, I, I want you to, you're going to have plenty of time to listen to it, but he's going to begin by making a statement, and then it's not going to sound like it went blank. It didn't. Wait, he'll come back on. Well, I'm already sitting in line when I think of that CD on the seat over there. And forward, stop, forward, stop, until I realize I can't keep the air conditioning going on this, and it was hot. So I rolled all my windows down, <clears throat> and I remember that CD. 
Oh, I got all kinds of time to listen to that. So I reach over, pop it in. <laughs> now, there's cars beside me, you know, in the line, three people in line there. And uh, here comes this 97 year old powerful voice. You know what he says? You'll never believe what this man said. There are more liars in this church this morning than all of Vancouver, British Columbia. And it goes silent. And the guy in the car beside me, his windows are down. He looks over and he says, Amen. <laughs> And I thought, whoops, I forgot to turn the volume down. It's different when you're on Bluetooth with it, you know. You have it up so you can hear if a person, if they're just whispering in the phone. Well, that last person I'd talked to had just whispered. And so I had the volume all the way up. And I mean, his voice blared out across those cars. A couple of people, honk, honk. <laughs> I thought, they must be agreeing too. So I know we're all in suspense in that line. What's he going to say next? Silence. Silence. This guy's looking at me. <laughs> Is there any more? Well, his car moves ahead, and he gets ahead of me. Another car comes up. <laughs> and I think the thing has failed. I mean, four or five moves and nothing said, it, it had to fail. So I pop it out and look at it. And it hadn't failed. So now i got to put it in. And you know with CDs, you start all over again. <laughs> ah! I better turn the volume down this time. <laughs> I'm going to have a riot in this line. <laughs> there are more liars in this church this morning. Then in all of Vancouver, British I thought I turned it low enough. This guy's, he didn't have the nerve to say amen. <laughs> I don't know what he thought. I didn't hear his thoughts. So I leave it in then. And that dear old 97-year-old preacher must have had a songbook in his hand. And he said, you know, Look at the heading of songs. There are songs of commitment. There are songs of dedication. There are songs of worship. And he says, did you know what you were singing here this morning? We sang songs of dedication. We sang songs of commitment. We sang songs about falling on our faces before the Lord. How many of you fell on your faces before the Lord? You're all liars if you didn't. Why did you sing it and not do it? Uh, oh, dear Lord. Oh, my goodness. That's potent. That's potent. He said, don't you know you're responsible for the words that come out of your mouth, even if they're in song and somebody else wrote them? Nobody's twisting your arm behind your back to make you sing them. <laughs> He learned something at 97. I, I began reminiscing in my life. And if you, if you listen to me very much on whatever I'm on, Facebook, Hagman and Hagman, Rick Wiles, True News, uh, whatever I'm on, you never know where I'm going to pop up in the media. You might see me in, on NBC. <laughs> You might see me on BBC. You never know where I'm going to pop up. I've, I've been on most of the major news networks around the world, not by my choice, not because I asked for it, but because I just did a crazy thing. So unusual that the media had to publicize it. You know what I mean? Like walking between the Israeli Defense Force and the Hezbollah. When the Israeli Defense Force is ready to open fire and blow them out of the rocks, here comes Henry Gruber on a lovely walk with Jesus right between them. The BBC newsman says, why, it's an American. He's going to get his full head blown off. <laughs> I didn't know it. <laughs> then they put it on NBC News in America. I was up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a man walked up to me after I spoke in this hotel, and he says, I saw you on 
NBC News. I said, I wasn't on NBC News recently. He says, oh, yes, you were. It was covered by BBC. I said, oh, no. They showed it in America, too. He says, yeah, you were going to get your full head blown off. <laughs> I said, I guess that's my claim to fame. I get to be on the news, and I don't know it until later because I've done something so foolish in the eyes of man. But you know what? I walked with the Prince of Peace between the Hezbollah and the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. And when that Israeli officer hollered, hiding down behind that half-track, that's a half-tank and a half-truck, you know, they're all crouching down with that big gun ready to blow the Hezbollah out of the rocks. I hear somebody hollering, come over here, come here, and he's doing this, run, run. Hey, I was never told to run. The Bible says if you will walk in the Spirit. <laughs> so I just walked a little faster over to him. He grabbed me and pulled me down behind that, that armored vehicle. What are you doing here? Don't you know this is forbidden territory? I'm saying, oh, Lord, help me. What do I say? And the words come out of my mouth. I'm just praying for the peace of Jerusalem. It took all the fire out of him. And his voice just calmed right down, you see. You see, God knows how to deal with his loved ones, his people, his chosen fleshly people. He knows where their heart is. I didn't. He says, now listen, I'm going to send you with these two soldiers you go with them, you stay down, you only stay on the tracks where we came in because there are mines here. Where did you come in to hear from? I said, up by the, the border of Jordan. He said, that's all razor wire. I said, I know, I crawled through it. He said, couldn't you read the signs? I said, no, they were in Hebrew and Arabic. Oh, he says, he must have thought we got to put it in English now. These Americans are so dumb. Those signs said, danger, minefield. Do you know you walk through a minefield? <laughs> no, I didn't know it. Ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Ignorance is wonderful. <laughs> My Jesus knows just what I need to step on the right spots. My Jesus knows just what I need. I wish I could sing better. He satisfies, I'm not going to make it, and every need supplies. Lord, you know where the minds are. You're telling me to dance now. Okay, we're going to do this just right because you know right where the minds are. You order my steps. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't know there were minds there. All I knew was I was expressing my love for my Lord and having a wonderful walk with him because he said, today I'm going to walk down through no man's land. Would you like to go with me? And I said, I would love to go with you. <laughs> I love to be invited to walk with my Lord. So well, that's how I got on BBC. <laughs> that's how I got on NBC. Well, it's an exciting life. If you live a boring life, then why are you doing it? It's time to change. It's time to get excited about the God that you just sang about. Do you know how many times you sang those words over and over and over? He is the God, the creator of the universe. Now, remember, I went all the way to the Milky Way and back. I, I backslid through heaven. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the truth. I backslid to heaven. I died in a sitting position. I went through the valley of the shadow of death, sitting down, going backwards. I shot out of the valley of the shadow of death into the heavens, saw the entire earth in my full periphery, and the earth was just 
small that fast till it was down to the size of a golf ball. I looked over and saw the moon, looked into the crater of the moon. The, so many people have asked me, did you, did you see the lunar machine, you know, the lunar car? I says, no, I wasn't looking for it. I was just in awe saying, that's the moon. Wow. And it's getting smaller and smaller. And that's the way I passed every planet. I could hear it before I saw it. That really impressed Dr. Romanowski. He said, you know, we have big, big satellite dishes down in Chile in a row. If you ever watched the movie called Contact, that's where that was filmed. They were listening to the planets. They literally, that's true, they listened to the planets. They have a logbook of the song or the sound of every planet. They know exactly which planet to listen to. They just punch in the code for that planet, and one of those big dishes beams right in on that planet because it has a distinctive voice just like you do. Isn't that awesome? Heaven sings. That's what he asked Job. Where were you? Where were you, Job, when the morning stars sang together? Huh? I didn't know they could sing. Yeah, they do. (laughs) That's my God. He has a massive choir up there. I heard it. And, uh, you know, I told him that and talked to him about a lot of things, and he explained them to me. And until the day the Lord took him home, he died about three years ago of a heart attack. He, uh, well, it might have been cancer. I think it was cancer he was battling. It was cancer. They were trying their best to save his life, sent him to the best doctors and all. But he loved the Lord, loved the Lord. But I had many conversations with him, and he'd call and tell me about things that were going on and all and say, what do you think about that? Well... Anyhow, I said this a while ago, and I've got to finish this because I dropped it. Wow, I really do. You see, last time I looked at that clock, I'm telling you, Joel, you're speeding that clock up. <laughs> it was 11.25. Now, look, at how can a half an hour go that fast? It's impossible. <laughs> I'm in this traditional church, non-spirit-filled church, okay? One year after I died in the accident, 1984, 1985, I'm in this spirit-filled church. I'm up there teaching prayer walking. I'm keeping, believe it or not, I'm standing in one place. I'm not wandering around. It's difficult, but I'm able to do it because I have my notes on prayer walking. I can stand still if I have notes, but I don't have any notes this morning. And Jesus steps up behind me. You know what he said to me? He said, I thought I'd just let you pass through the heavens before I roll them up like a scroll and throw them away and create new ones. (laughs) Meltdown right in front of these traditional Christian people that don't show emotions. I'm blubbering away, saying, I'm sorry, I can't talk. Because Jesus has flashed back in my mind when I was seven years old and the Sunday school teacher taught that on the flannel board. And most of you don't know what a flannel board is. You now have these lovely audio visuals. But it's just flannel like flannel pajamas or flannel p- pillowcase. And you put the paper dolls or you put the planets up on there and they stick, believe it or not. Well, I was seven years old, and she grabbed that, had all these beautiful planets on the flannel board, and she just grabbed the end of it and started rolling them up and threw them right in front of my face in the garbage can. That offended me. Why did you do that? I've never seen a Sunday school teacher throw away the lesson. So I got home. I crawled under Dad's camping trailer. Right down by the axles, my brothers and sister were all playing in the yard. I didn't want them to see me. They were older than me. And so I crawled down and propped my elbows up on that axle. Dad always had it painted up pretty and everything. It was clean. I propped my elbows on the, and God puts me right back to seven-year-old body. 
standing in front of these traditional church people, I see a vision. Huh, you, what a place for God to give you a vision. In the middle of people that don't believe in visions. He showed me my seven-year-old body. He recorded that. And I heard my seven-year-old voice. Dear Jesus, I don't like what the Sunday school teacher said this morning. But I know it's in the Bible, so I believe it. But I only have one request. If you're going to destroy all those beautiful planets and everything and throw them in the garbage, could I stand beside you when you create new ones? I want to watch you put them out there. You see why it was a meltdown? He showed me he loved me that much. How much has he recorded you? What kind of requests have you asked him of? They're all recorded. If they were spoken from a true heart of love for your Savior, they're recorded. And he wants you to experience them. If they're not fulfilled in your life yet, get in love with Jesus. Delight yourself in him. And he promises in his word, you delight yourself in me. And I will, I will, it's the will of God, I will give you the desires of your heart. And many desires of the heart are experienced in the times of what we call soaking in the times of when we sing like we were singing this morning, and you enter in and you delight yourself in the Lord, and you forget about people on the right, the left, before and behind, and you have some floor time. You get alone with the Lord, and you just you express your love for Him. The world, the world doesn't even exist as far as you're concerned. Now, that big man on that train in Tokyo, you remember him? I didn't answer. I didn't finish that testimony. This is finish time in the next minute. Oh, I got a half an hour. Woohoo! Wow! Oh, man! Hey, I'll, I'll take it. Okay, thank you, Joe. Woo! I thought you said 12. Whew. Okay, I can slow down. Now, where was I? <laughs> Remember, he said, I'll make that, I'll use that for toilet paper. That hurt. I love the word. When I battled that cancer, I read the word most of the night and would just hug it. I love the word. The word of God is alive, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can even go down and discern your thoughts and intents of your heart and your mind. And it can even go between what doctors cannot do. The best of doctors, even with their electron microscopes, they cannot separate the marrow and the bone. They can do a marrow bone transplant, but they don't know where. I read it just a while back. They still cannot discern where the marrow and the bone separate. But the Word of God... <laughs> it does it. Woohoo! Right in there where those old cancer cells start being produced. The Word of God is alive and it can do surgery where the doctors can't. So I put my trust in the Lord. How do you know if you put your trust in the Lord? The Word of God says, let all them. How much is all? All of you that rejoice today. How do you know if you really put your trust in the Lord? You rejoiced. If you're really trusting the Lord, you say, well, I'm, I'm trying to live by faith. I trust the Lord. I've known him for 20 years now. And I'm, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm going to look at you if you say that to me that way. And I'm going to say, wait a minute. The word of God is more powerful than you are. Well, of course it is. Well, you see, the, the Word of God says the evidence of trusting the Lord is you can rejoice. I didn't hear any rejoicing. I hear fear. I hear you looking at all the circumstances. You're listening to the doctor's report. We were in a meeting last night, and that precious sister went the full bore, the full run with the doctors, and she is cancer-free. We shouted. We rejoiced. There are two ways of being cancer-free, with a doctor or with a great physician. 
Now, the doctors don't have as good, I'm sorry if you're a doctor, this is nothing personal, please. Don't leave. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm teasing him. I know he's not a doctor. <laughs> the doctor's success report is quite minimal with cancer. They're doing the best they know how, but they still have a very, very small success rate. We're losing brothers and sisters every year with that big C. I hate that. I hate cancer with a passion because it tried to take my life. It went as so far as metastasizing into my backbone. I took nothing for the pain. I spent six hours in convulsions. The pain would be so great I would pass out. As soon as I came to, I was calling on the Lord again until I passed out again. After six hours, my wife said, Honey, I can't take any more. Do you want me to call an ambulance? She was crying. I was putting her through it. I didn't want to put her through that. She didn't deserve it. I don't like to make people suffer. You know what I mean? And she said that, and I had about 20 to 30 seconds before I'd pass out again because the pain would be so bad. And she said that to me as I came to. I was laying on the floor, and I looked at her, and I said, No, honey, I don't want an ambulance. I want the glory of God. That's all I want. I just want the glory, and I passed out again. You see, the glory of God is a multiplier. The glory of God will take that little bitty mustard seed of faith down inside of you, and it will blow it up into a big tree that birds can rest in and, and roost in. That's, that's the glory of God. <laughs> and that's what my Savior in John chapter 17 prayed before he went to the cross. He said, the glory which you gave me before the world began, I have given them. That's have. That's past tense, isn't it? It's yours. It's available. I grew up, I don't know why they taught this. No one can take the glory of God. No one can partake of the glory. I started reading the book, and it taught me differently. Why did Jesus say, the glory that I had with you since the world began, I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. You in me and me and you and them in us. Ha <laughs> ha. That they all may be made perfect in one. Woo. That word perfect in the Greek means mature. Mature. <laughs> Coming to full age. Oh, church. You are at the threshold of the Ephesians 527 church. You are not at the threshold of the Acts 2 church. We left that way back there in Jerusalem. You are now at the threshold of the glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. You are at the threshold of shining glorious as a bride adorned for her husband. Hallelujah. It's time. <laughs> it's time to come over that threshold. I've... I've married off five of my six daughters. And I've stood at that threshold with my arm like this, you know. And she's had hold of my arm. And she's dressed up beautiful in the veil over her face. And, and the music is going da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da. And when it starts doing that, I turn to my daughter and say, Honey, it's not too late. To make an about face, and I'll get you out of here. If you have the slightest doubt, let's get out of here. And my most common thing my daughter will say is, come on, Daddy. I love him. Don't make me cry. It'll mess up all my makeup. <laughs> Well, anyhow, the big fellow that sat beside me there in Tokyo, we got to get this over. <laughs> You're wondering what happened. <laughs> I said to him with a smile, I said, you know, this book is the most precious set of words 
in the entire universe. And I didn't say it smart. I just said it with gentle words and a smile. And he looked at me and he said, I hate that book. I have been given, I've been, I have, and have given orders to burn thousands of them in Romania. If I had my way, there would not be another one of them on the face of the earth. I smiled and I said, I'm glad you haven't had your way. <laughs> Ooh, his face began to get fatter and redder and his blood vessels bulging. I didn't mean to get under his skin. I was just heaping coals of fire on his precious head. Isn't that what the word says? Love will cover the multitude of sins. You sing it. Love lifted me. Where did it lift you from? I was sinking deep in sin. <laughs> but love lifted me. Well, love will lift them out too. I was expecting an awesome testimony. That was my motive. I sit there remitting his sins. That's what I was taught to do. I didn't do it out loud. Lord, I remit this man's sins. He's a wicked sinner. He wants to use your, to yeah, your, blah, 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 your word for toilet paper. I don't even like saying that. And, and, and he'd like to eradicate your word from the earth. I didn't say it out loud. I just said, Father in heaven, I remit this man's sins. Pour your goodness upon him. Give him the Romans 2-4 treatment. The goodness of God that leads to repentance. Every one of you that have found Jesus... If you've genuinely found Jesus, you found him because his goodness overshadowed you. You felt the love of God. You felt a need of a loving Savior. You felt sinful, and you heard that there was one that would forgive you of all your sins. Oh, hallelujah. And it was the goodness of God that brought you to that decision. Well... He, he wasn't responding to the goodness of God very kindly. He said, you're American. I said, yeah, I'm American. He said, I knew it. Where do you live? I said, I live in Woodbine, Iowa. Where is that? I said, it's about an hour and a half drive from Des Moines, the capital city. He says, I know Des Moines. I've been there. I used to be head of the Communist Party of the United States. And I thought, woo -hoo, Lord, you put me with people in high places. <laughs> I feel honored today that you put me with a man that was once of the head of the Communist Party of the United States of America. And now I'm sitting right beside him on the train. Woo -hoo, what are you going to do? What do I get to witness today? I'll take the axe, Lord. Give me the axe, one eight, the power to be a witness, to see what you're going to do. Give me the ax. You ever ask God to give you the ax? <laughs> Start doing it. Ask him to set you up. It'll surprise you when he does because he, he, will, he will not set you up in any way that you think. It'll always surprise you. That's a setup. Accept it. Recognize it. It's good for you. It's, it's a wonderful experience. It can shake you down to your bootstraps. It can cause sudden fear. But he even covered that. Don't be afraid of sudden fear, but overcome it with God. So see, every realm that you will ever experience is all covered by the Word of God. If you don't think so, read the last six verses of, of Romans chapter 8. Begins with, shall anything separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus your Lord? Think back now and do inventory since last Sunday, has anything separated you from the love of God in Christ Jesus in the last week? Think. Inventory. If it has, then you violated Romans chapter 8. You got to repent. It's all right. Just repent so it doesn't happen again. That repent means to do an about face, right? Just turn around from it. Don't do it again. He'll forgive you. So, I said, oh, 
So, uh, so is that why you're in Japan? He said, yes, I'm head of the Communist Party in Japan. And I thought, hmm, I've been seeing your big black vans with all this propaganda written on them and the loudspeakers on them, and you go down the streets of Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and all these major cities blaring away with your propaganda. And I thought, I finally get to sit beside the man that gives the orders. You know, when you go on a ship, you always go to the captain first to ask permission to board. He's the government, right? I was sitting by the governor of the Communist Party of Japan. I love to meet governors. I love to meet people in high places. Because you know what? The higher they are when they come to Jesus, the farther they fall. The meaner, the tougher they are, the more brute force they are, the more they blubber and bawl. I've seen some of these powerful bodybuilders. Mr. Teenage America, 1959, Wayne Coleman. Front page of the Atlas magazine, Muscle Man magazine. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, body you know, a blonde-headed girl on each shoulder. When he came to Jesus, he bawled and squalled. <laughs> when that mafia guy I was talking about a while ago came to Jesus, he bawled and bawled. And he says, I spent 40 years of my life being tough, and now you've made me a big ball, baby. I said, isn't it wonderful? I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> but he couldn't quit bawling because, you see, I challenged him, and he didn't like that. You, you skinny little punk, challenge me. Do you know one clean sweep with my hand that's been broken 16 times here. My hand is a lethal weapon. One clean sweep and your head would fly off. My hand is a lethal weapon. And you challenge me. <laughs> I love it. I didn't love it at the time because he, <laughs> I was sitting there and he, when he said it, he was standing like this and I thought, dear Lord, what have I got myself into? My head flying, <laughs> I could lose my head over this thing. <laughs> I said, I challenge you to say these words and ask Jesus to forgive you for every person you've murdered, every young girl you've abducted off the streets and shipped off to a ranch where you made them high-profile prostitutes for Vegas. He had confessed these things to me trying to convince me that God wouldn't forgive him. Hmm. So far, not one person on the face of the earth that I have faced in my life has been able to convince me that God couldn't forgive them. <laughs> and I've faced some of the meanest, onriest cusses you ever saw in your life. I've faced him with knives at my throat and guns at my head, and I've faced him with him telling me how I'm going to die, how I'm going to meet my maker. They make a mistake, though. They ask me what I think of it. <laughs> Why do they do that? I've been asked that many times. What do you think about that? Do they really want to know? I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> well, how do you talk when you got a knife pushing right above your Adam's apple? You don't swallow, first of all. I don't. <laughs> you cut your own throat. You lose your voice. Then you've lost your witness and your testimony. You need healing. You're in need instead of your aggressor. <laughs> I don't like turning the tables. So he said, uh, this guy on the train said, what are you doing in Japan? I said, uh, I have, at that point, I'd walked about 28 islands. I said, I've been walking every island and 
communing with my God and praying. Oh, he says, I don't want to hear that. I said, well, you asked me. I don't believe in God. And all these dear Japanese people on that train are looking at me like, what are you doing to that man? <laughs> so finally his stop comes up, and it's coming up. And it's just pouring rain at that point, and he's got this umbrella. I was concerned about that umbrella that might have had a hidden spear in it, and he's going to zap me before he leaves. But I, I was relieved when he said to me, it's raining. I said, yeah. My God makes it rain too, and he makes it stop raining. He's just gritting his teeth, chewing on that. I'll sell you my umbrella for 20 bucks. See, that put me at ease. I knew he wouldn't sell me his weapon for 20, so I felt better. <laughs> I says, no, thank you. I'll be getting off in Tokyo, and that's inside the, the building, and I won't need it. Thank you very much. Well, he said, I got to go. I said, I'll see you again as he stood up. And he looked back with a scowl, and he said, I don't think so. And he's stuck because all this, waiting for the door to open, and all these people are jammed up at the door. So he's about as far away from me as you are, Joel. He can hear me. And I said, oh, yes, you will, sir. I said, you'll either see me beforehand, and you'll call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and find how much he loves you, or else the day will come when your knee will bow, and you will confess that he is God, only to know that you don't know him. And you've chosen side with the devil and all his angels. And you have to be thrust out of his presence. Jesus loves you too much for that. Oh, he is steaming. He is captive audience. I don't like preaching to captive audience, but there's times when it's necessary. You know what I mean? They've got to hear the gospel. Now, that's the time when the Scripture's absolutely spot on when it says, by the foolishness of preaching, men are saved. <laughs> when they're captive audience and they hate your guts and they'd love to thrust you through. <laughs> well... One of the things I told him that really irritated him, I said, you know when the leader of Romania fell, committed suicide? He said, yes, I know about that. I was there. I said, you know, I was on a train. I was heading for Romania, and I was heading for Bucharest to walk and pray. And I said, my God told me to get off before I got to Bucharest and go across to the station and get back and leave and go back home. He had canceled my assignment to walk in Bucharest. And I said, you know, I can never pronounce a man's name right, Chistetsi or something like that. I said, you know what he was doing at that time in Bucharest. My wife saw it on television in America. His troops were going down the street shooting men, women, and children, piling their bodies by the truckloads into the trucks and going out and burying them in mass graves that were being bulldozed out, dumping them like, like rocks into the pit that they had dug and covering their bodies over. And my wife was crying because she knew I was supposed to be that day in Bucharest. And she was looking. Every one of those news scan that scanned the street, she was looking for her husband and crying. I said, but she didn't know until I got all the way back to New York City and called her in Portland, Oregon, and said, hi, honey. And she said, Henry, you're alive. I said, yeah, why? She said, don't you know what's on the news? I says, no. Where are you at? I'm in, I'm in New York. She says, where? What part of Romania is New York? I said, I'm in New York City. America? I says, yeah. Oh, she said, thank you, Jesus. Children, daddy's in New York City. He's alive. I said, what is going on? What has happened? She said, oh, honey, it's been on the news that man has been going down the street with machine, just automatic weapons, killing everybody on the streets and hauling them, dumping their bodies like rocks into massive graves. And we've been looking to see if you were on there. I said, well, thank you, Jesus. I feel bad about that. But you see, he saved my life. 
He had more for me to do. You see, our God is in control. If we'll let him be. Do you know how to know when you are walking in the Spirit? That's a simple little question, but it's a profound question. It's a very important question for every Christian on the face of the earth. Do you know when you are truly walking in the Spirit, in the will of God? Do you know? What would, what would you say? What would be the most common expression you would speak? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Huh? You have peace. You have peace. That's what he told me at 18. The first time the Lord ever spoke to me about walking, he said, start walking. I will give you peace, and I'll give you a song. If at any time you ever lose the peace and you can't think of the song, stop, go back, and find the peace and the song. Never go anywhere without the peace or the song because I found out he's the prince of peace. And if you walk with the Prince of Peace, it's all right. That's why I walked between the Israeli Defense Force and the Hezbollah. Before that, I sit in the middle of the Hezbollah. You've heard the testimony. They were going to start by stripping my clothes off, pulling my fingernails out by the, the, the roots, and they were going to skin me alive, and they'd find out everything I knew. <laughs> Well, they found out a portion of what I knew. I was so afraid I didn't have peace, but I couldn't get up and walk away. I was surrounded by the Hezbollah. Now, that's a time when you want to go and find peace. <laughs> and you cry, but you can't because your mouth won't work. You try to shut your eyes to pray, and they won't stay shut. They just blink, 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 blink. You ever been that afraid? I was that afraid. I could not keep my eyes shut. Because I thought when that man spoke those words in Arabic and that guy pulled that lovely, lovely long pair of snub nose pliers out, my imagination went crazy. My daddy, they had to be the same kind of snub nose pliers my daddy used to skin catfish with. Now, you tell me that's merciful. But God was testing me out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 if I would be obedient to what I knew in the Word. You know what it says? Casting down. What does that mean? I, I won't cast this down. But casting down what? Imaginations and fears and every vain thing that boasts itself against the knowledge of God. Not your knowledge, the knowledge of God. What does he say about his knowledge? Pastor put it in his bulletin, I think. I was reading it. The very scripture that he gave for today, I think it's today. I was reading it at the breakfast table. I think Don brought it home early. Sorry, Don. Uh, <laughs> he helps in the office. He got a bulletin early. So I was reading it at breakfast. I know my thoughts of you, thoughts of good and not of evil. That's my God's thoughts. Thoughts of good and not of evil that I may bring you to an expected end. Do you think God is going to be deprived from what he expects to bring you to an end? No way. In Zechariah chapter 2, he says, He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of my eye. Hey, we're right back where I started from today. Let's end with that. That apple of the eye is an expression in the ancient Hebrew that's the same expression of you young people or whatever age you were, when you fell in love. And we say here, it's, a, it's the sparkle is in their eye. We know those two are in love. They never want to be away from each other. They're always snugging up to each other. They never want to be away, and they look at each other. When I saw my son Peter with, with Teresa, when I saw him looking at her, I saw that he loved her with all of his heart. I knew a wedding was on the way. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Number four son's going to get married. There's going to be a wedding. And do you know what? In that wedding, I don't think he even knew mom and dad existed. He was just looking into her eyes. And smiling and smiling and smiling. I thought, Peter, we're here. <laughs> he didn't hear. He didn't look. 
He was carried away, you see. That's, that's what it says about the Lord and his love for you. He says, you are the apple of my eye. It's time for us to respond in that way to him. Have you ever seen a one-sided love affair? Pan Am Flight 103, the last flight that made it over Lockerbie, Scotland, out of London, heading for America. I was on that plane. I watched a young lady that was in love, three people up in front of me. She was in love with that, that young man of Libya. That was the days when Gaddafi was the bin Laden. And she was telling everybody in line before we got our boarding pass, we're going to New York to get married, my parents. This is my fiancé. And he, I never saw one sparkle in his eye, and all of my alarms as a daddy went off, and I started eagle eye on that man and watching him and praying and saying, how dare you let her carry on like that, and you don't respond. Well, you see, he got my attention. Well, just before they got up there to get the boarding pass, he hands her his handbag and his ticket. That was his mistake, and said, I need to use the toilet, and took off running. The lady at the counter said, you have two tickets here. Where's the other party? Oh, he needed to use the toilet. She's looking at the names on the tickets. She says, did the other party give you anything to carry on? Yes, yes, ma'am, this. Give it to me now. That was in Heathrow. Handed to her. She ran over, put it on this machine, put a canister by it. Alarms went off all over the place. And all of a sudden, every monitor there in Heathrow was flashing this man running through the terminal. They had him that quick. If you see him, drop and scream. The bottom of that handbag was full of plastic explosives with a detonator. My plane was to be blown out of the air. The Lord saved my life that time. The very next flight, Pan Am, Flight 103, was gone. Do You don't think I hang on to that ticket stub? The last successful flight of Pan Am 103 out of London. You see, that's why the Bible says, fear not. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. I want to I wanna close with this scripture. Isaiah chapter 43. This is what I've been talking to you. Don't be afraid to obey the Lord. Don't be afraid to do marketplace ministry. Yes, you could not possibly be any more bashful and shy than I was at 18 years old. But look how Jesus taught me. He said, Henry, you're afraid to talk to people about me, aren't you? I had a hundred gospel tracts in my pocket when he asked me that. I grabbed one out and held it like this and looked into the heavens and I said, yes, Father, I am afraid to talk to people about you, but I'm not ashamed of you or I wouldn't be out here trying to hand these out. Now, God doesn't mind you talking to him like that. That's honesty. And you know what he said to me, Henry? I kn you mean you knew God's voice? I knew his voice at 13. In the Pentecostal church, we were taught by our parents, you must know the voice of God. Had my first vision at 13. That was before I spoke with tongues. Oh, so you can have visions before you speak with tongues. I did. Why can't you? So I, I, I said that to the Lord, and he said so kindly to me, I know, Henry, I know. You're afraid to talk to people about me. But will you talk to me about people? And at 18, I looked up and I said, you mean pray for people? And then I went, duh. Talking to God is praying. That's what an 18-year-old does. Duh. Stupid. <laughs> I was a normal 18-year-old. I don't think I was abnormal. <laughs> But look, listen to this, Isaiah 43. It begins with two words here in the King James, but now. When is now? Will now ever change? So what are you going to do now? Oh, I got gotcha. you. You're not going to fear anymore. My page keeps trying to turn, and I don't think it's the Lord. 
because I haven't got time to preach that page. <laughs> but now thus saith the Lord that created you. We're right back to what we sang today, the Creator. Oh, Jacob, uh-oh, you're not allowed to say, I'm not worthy. Jacob was not worthy, was he, before he put his head on that rock as a pillow and saw a ladder going up and angels going up and down to heaven. He had his heavenly experience. And I'll tell you what, he wrestled. He caught hold of one of those angels. He wouldn't let go. The sun was coming up, and that angel said, you got to let go. The people will see me. I'm not supposed to be seen. Let go. I won't let go till you bless me. So the angel said, all right, I'm going to bless you. But boom, he smote him in the thigh. And from that day, Jacob walked different. <laughs> and when you have an encounter with God, you'll walk different. doesn't mean you're going to be walk crippled, but you'll walk different. Your walk will change. But now... Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed you, O Israel. You see, he remade you. He created you, then he rebuilt you. Fear not. What did he say? The creator you sing about this morning. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, you are mine. Do you see why I get so excited? These words make me want to dance with him. Hallelujah. I'm his and he is mine. You, you said it. You sang it this morning. I had a hard time containing myself. Now, how much does he love you? When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When you walk <laughs> through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee, since you were precious in my sight. I'm going to stop right there. Since you were precious in my sight. You are precious in his sight. Respond to him. He was, you were singing it. He was saying, I come to you. Come to me. Don't ever sing those songs without responding. All right? Father, I pray that you just seal these words in each heart, that they will bring forth an abundance after their kind that the mantle of your anointing will fall upon each one that has been feeding on this this morning, and that as they have been feeding on it and receiving it, feasting in it, not because of who I am, but because of your word and who you are, all glory goes to you. But we get to be partakers of that glory, that we may be one. Let your glory visit each one of these that we may be one in you and you one in us. Bless them, Lord. Keep your hand upon destiny. Bless them abundantly, Lord, and multiply them and prosper them in every way, I pray, that you may be exalted and your holy name may be lifted up higher than any other name in earth or heaven. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Ah, thank you.